Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Victoria Lawn Cemetery for our annual Guided Spirit Walks. My name is Sarah, public programmer at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center, and I am so pleased to be your guide this evening for playing favorites, stories from the past. Our annual Guided Spirit Walks are an excellent opportunity for everyone to learn more about the individuals who once lived in their community. Some of those individuals are famous, some infamous, and some forgotten to time. Theater, working together with historical narrative, truly lifts history off the written page. We've presented the Spirit Walks through wind, rain, and surprise September heat waves. This year had a different challenge in store for us, and while we are so disappointed we are unable to produce in-person walks, we hope this evening's virtual guided walk helps to bridge the void until a time when it is safe for us to all gather again. Please consider making a donation to the museum in support of our programming by contacting the museum at 905-984-8880 or by emailing museum at stcatherines.ca. We know that you enjoy hearing stories from our city's past as much as we do. And so tonight we are playing favorites and selecting the best of the last eight years of Guided Spirit Walk scenes to share with you. We hope you enjoy this romp through the past. are too corrupt for women. But if politics are too corrupt for women, then surely politics are too corrupt for men. Yes. 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 When social conditions are corrupt, women cannot escape by shutting their eyes and paying no interest. It would be far better if we were able to have a chance to clean things up. Yes. 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 Women have been cleaning since time began. And if women ever get into politics, there will be cleaning out pigeonholes and forgotten corners on which dust of years has fallen. And the sound of the political carpet beater will be heard throughout the land. Yes! yes. 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 Women are at work across the country, in factories and on farms. Why should we do the work of men and not have the same rights? Yes. 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 Why do men have to be so stubborn? Yes. 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 Once everyone realized that women have two very capable hands, and should be employed in the war effort, the Employment Bureau began to organize university women into munitions factories and onto farms by exempting us from exams. And thank goodness they put us out on those farms. Farmers were refusing to put in tomatoes, onions, and other vegetables because they had not been able to get them gathered last year. It did take some convincing though. Those farmers were so stubborn it was extreme need only that induced those growers to listen to the proposition that city girls should come to fill the gap left by many men gone to war. Meeting after meeting of the growers was called. The men sat silent and distrustful. Do you need pickers? Yes. Can you get them? No. Well, do you want to guarantee work to these girls? Silence! No! no. 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 We have proved men wrong. Our farmer was finally persuaded to let us 500 city girls from Toronto have a go at something other than picking. He sent 15 of us to clean up an old vineyard that had been neglected for two years. A plow had cleaned between the rows, but there were tall weeds growing along the vines. The soil was heavy clay, now baked hard. It might as well have daunted us girls. But hour after hour we hacked and we pulled while mosquitoes grew thicker as we moved farther up the mountain. Some weeks later, the farmer told us that no man could be got to tackle that vineyard, but we did it and we showed him. After that day, even if there was no picking to be done, no girl on that farm lacked work. 
Now let's go, ladies. The Suffragettes, portrayed by Karen Donald, Jackie Conway, Megan Lamott, and Kathy LeBlanc, along with the Farmerette, portrayed by Amanda Ballack, were an important and lively scene from 2014, when the tours told the story of the outbreak of the First World War, along with the response of the many women who arrived in Niagara as a crop-saving force in the summers during the war. Lieutenant Colonel Frank Case McCordick played tonight by longtime Spirit Walk and museum volunteer Des Corin, has made a few appearances in our Spirit Walks. This scene, written for the walks in 2016, depicts McCordick's time commanding the officers training camp in Kent, England in 1916 during the First World War, and features a letter written to McCordick by another St. Catharines officer, Lieutenant Watson Syme, here played by Fraser Morgan. Gentlemen, I am Lieutenant Colonel McCordick, Brigadier of the 2nd Canadian Training Brigade. Welcome to East Sandling, Kent. I will begin by impressing on you the great importance of your work. You must realize that however good and skillful a disposition may be, battles must be won by fighting. The heroism, skills, and firmness of the most junior officers will have the most far-reaching results. You are responsible for leading your men in battle. You are responsible for their safety, as far as that can be ensured while gaining success. You are responsible for their health, for their comfort, for their good behavior, and for their discipline. And last but not least, you are responsible for maintaining the honor of the Empire and of Canada by doing all you can to ensure the security of England, of our own country, our women, and the children who follow us. Now, if you are a good officer, you will have important influence on your soldiers, and no doubt they will have you in their thoughts in their greatest time of trial. An officer of mine, Lieutenant Watson Syme, wrote me a letter most recently after being captured by the Germans while fighting in France. My dear Colonel McCordick, if you haven't already heard, you'll be surprised to get this letter from me in Germany. It happened at that awful slaughter, the third battle of Yeep. And even now, when I think of it all, I doubt my reality of existence. Everything was okay at 7.30 a.m. on the 2nd of July. A little morning heat in the way of trench mortars, that was all. I had just visited a few of my guns and had passed Generals Mercer and Williams when the storm broke. It lasted for five hours, and by the time the Germans came over, there were few left to oppose them. By a miracle, the 15-yard bay of the front line, where I was with six others, was not leveled like all the rest of the line, and we did our best with rifles and bombs. I got a crack on the head, and three hours later I found myself in a shell hole. And I tried to crawl back through, but at dawn was caught. I'm very comfortable here, and glad to have the company of Colonel Usher, Captain Light, Captain Frank Park, and about 20 other Canadians. Good luck, and best regards to all. Watson Syme. Good officers will also remember that while there are important logistical concerns before an attack, like synchronizing your watch with the other officers, it is important to understand that bold and energetic action makes for success. When you see a company on the march, slack looking, miserable, dirty, slow, almost sulky and coming to the attention, with half a dozen stragglers creeping along behind and the officers and NCOs taking no notice, you can tell at once these are bad officers and that no discipline or energy exists there. On the contrary, when you see a company on the march, well closed up, men with their heads erect even though covered with mud from the trenches, and quick and energetic in their movements as they go to the salute, 
These show good officers and a well-disciplined company. When you take your men into action, either in ordinary trench warfare or a major attack, all this discipline, all this training will repay you and your men a thousandfold. Now let's get to work. In 2013, we dove into the stories of life alongside the Welland Canal. Instead of focusing on the broad history of industrial development, we chose to put a spotlight onto the stories of local individuals who lived and worked at building the foundations of our city. The story of Thomas Dover, portrayed by Joe Lamont, and the stories he tells of his friends reveal the hard and tragic realities of life alongside the Second Mellon Canal. The building of the Welland Canal was a very important part of history in this area. I worked on some of the lock gates and helped to build a lot of the lock tender houses along the canal. When I moved downtown in 1861, near Lock 3, to work at Mr. Simpson's shipyard, there was an intense strike by the carpenters in progress in the yard, including Mr. Shikluna's yard next door and all the yards along the canal, including Donaldson and Andrews, Muir Brothers, and Abbey Brothers. It all began in the summer of March of 1861 and continued through the summer when the yard owners locked out the workers and three carpenters set the Abbey Brothers shipyard on fire and burned it to the ground. Boy oh boy did they get in trouble. Mr. Simpson, afraid of strikes, did a lot for safety on the job at his yard. Everyone was concerned about safety on the job after Andrew Wilson died when he was crushed under a lock gate they were working on. He died instantly. A lot of people died by drowning in the canal. It's pretty common to see people bathing in the canal in the evenings. Every once in a while, a bather will slip under the cold, still water and not come back up. Poor William Vine had gone to bathe in the canal just below Lock 2. He got cramps while in the water and went under. Very sad. People see the still water and think it's safe, but it's not. He was only 19. Local poet John Blair wrote this poem about him. Another of those we love has left this world though higher flights to roam, and many saddened friends bereft will miss him in their earthly home. How fruitless all his study here, where are those hopes that rose so high? His friendship young to us so dear, but not too young or dear to die. Drowned, did they say, and near the spot where we played and sported too? Then when we pass, awakened thought will remind us of a heart that's true. His sparkling eyes and merry ways a generous heart with feelings fine will be remembered all our days. We'll miss and mourn for Willie Vine. In 2012, Niagara was awarded the prestigious title of the Cultural Capital of Canada. And many projects contributed to the explosion of art, culture, and heritage throughout Niagara. The Spirit Walks were one of these legacy projects and we are so happy they're continuing into their ninth year at many cemeteries around the region. Our next scene comes from this first year. Portrayed by Victor Packard, Lieutenant John Ball was in command of the guns at Ruman's Farms on Niagara River at the Battle of Queenston Heights in October of 1812 as the Americans crossed the river. It was the right thing to do. I joined the 1st Lincoln Militia in 1811. I was 23 years old and felt it my duty to help protect the land of my fellow countrymen and my neighbors here in Niagara from threat and harm. That following year, war broke out on our own soil. There were rumblings here and there. What with the Yankees hurt feelings by France and Britain, tensions were high. France and Britain in constant conflict and each endeavored to block the United States from trading with the other. And America, being the young and scrappy country that it was, was looking to show its might. So to war we went, 
against our neighbors, friends, and family. I knew life as a soldier would not be very comfortable, or long for that matter. My chances of coming home were less and less the more I stayed on the field. My skills put me in command of artillery, the large cannons which have their own risks. As an officer and as a comfortable man, I was used to warm beds and hearty meals with my family at home. During the war, there would be nights spent on cold, damp grass under stars and clouds of rain. No, I knew that life in the military would not be very comfortable at all. For many of us in our militia, the, the American attack at Queenston was our first day in battle. As lieutenant, I commanded a battery of guns from Veruman's farm. We were instructed to slow the American advance in their little rowboats, which we did quite effectively, yet the enemy came in large numbers. Word was delivered that General Brock had fallen, and that the enemy were so hot on us that the guns were ordered up to the battlefield by Captain Hallcroft. When the order had come, I had been yawning quite frequently, as a result of my weariness of firing at the Yankee guns all day. I lay on my cannon and fell asleep. Theodore Burgoyne was 17 years old when he was killed on October 7, 1914, while serving with the 19th Regiment in the Welland Canal Protection Force. Burgoyne was killed by fellow comrade Private Frank Hartley during an altercation in which Hartley shot Burgoyne in the head. Reports claimed Burgoyne died with his hands in his sweater pocket. Theodore was the nephew of W.B. Burgoyne, proprietor of the St. Catherine Standard newspaper. In the 2019 Spirit Walks, Burgoyne's tragic story, published as an obituary in the Standard, was shared by his mother, Ina Burgoyne, portrayed here by Rochelle Longton. A tragedy which comes nearer to the hearts of the people of St. Catharines than any other in the city's history was enacted on the canal bank at Loch Nine Wednesday night. Theodore Burgoing, the young son of Mrs. E. W. Burgoing, lies dead in the undertaker's room. His demise is mourned by the whole community, while Frank Hartley, an unknown, lies in a prison cell charged with murder. That it was a deliberate murder appears from every circumstance connected with the affair. Theodore Burgoyne fell dead with his hands in the pockets of his sweater coat, eloquent testimony that he was not anticipating an attack. The fact that Hartley had bullets in his rifle, which was against the rules, is strong evidence of premeditation. The tragedy occurred about seven o'clock. Sergeant Clarence Burgoyne, brother of the victim, at 6.45 called the role of the guard. Hartley's name was called, but he did not answer. But before the sergeant reached the end of the list, he appeared. He'd been to the city and was not properly dressed. The sergeant ordered him to stand aside, and they went down the stairs behind the lock house. Ten minutes later, Hartley was heard to remark something to the effect that he was not being given a square deal by Sergeant Burgoyne. Theodore Burgoyne heard the name mentioned, and walking out of a tent asked, Who says anything about Burgoyne? A little give and take talk ensued. Everybody thought it was quite good natured until it wasn't. Hartley suddenly swung round and raising his rifle shot point blank at Teddy Burgoyne. The bullet struck his nose and went through his head. Death was almost instantaneous. The news of the affair spread like wildfire Wednesday night and caused a strong feeling. Today, after people have a chance to fully realize the awfulness of it, a pall of sorrow has settled over the city, and the tragedy is discussed in hushed tones. For the widowed mother and brothers, the utmost sympathy is being expressed. He was a good soldier, said his brother. Those words would very aptly describe what his numberless friends thought of Teddy, 
a good soldier, a good fellow all the way through. Nobody had a word against him. You never heard anything but good things of young Teddy. He was one of the most enthusiastic soldiers of the 19th Regiment. He was in his 18th year. In 1866, James Curry resigned from Parliament and the Legislative Council, opposing Confederation. James Ray Benson, local businessman, was strongly urged by his peers and electors of St. Catharines to come forward as a candidate in the 1867 election as he was in favor of Confederation. Benson ran unopposed and sat in the first Canadian Parliament as the representative for Lincoln until March 1868 when he was named to the Senate of Canada to represent Ontario and St. Catharines. Our research into the St. Catharines connections, contributions, and debates of Confederation turned up only stories of male politicians. It was important for us to try to share often excluded perspectives of others, including the many women who, even in the background, played important roles in bringing Confederation to reality. Here, Marianne Benson, portrayed by Brenda Schultz, helps her husband, James Ray Benson, portrayed by Des Corin, with the political maneuverings vital to a successful career in politics. To the electors of the Electoral Division of Niagara. Perhaps you should begin by dealing with Curry. Gentlemen, having been presented with a requisition numerously signed by the electors of this division to fill the place lately vacated by the Honorable J.G. Curry, comprising the names of the leading men of all parties, and having formerly been the nominee of two conventions, I cannot refuse the desire so often expressed by my friends to offer myself as candidate for your suffrage. No, not the logistics of an election. I think you should deal with Curry. Put him out of his misery and the debate from the stage and go to the council with the full support of all Niagara behind you. Everyone should be reminded of your staunch support for Confederation and the benefits the Union will bring to Niagara. Something like the new Union will lower taxation, improve public services, and strengthen the economy. There would be closer links to the rest of the continent, better communications, and investment would be encouraged bringing renewed money into St. Catharines. It will not be considered necessary, I trust, for me to enter into a recital of my political principles. These must be well known to you after residence of more than 30 years. It may be sufficient to say they are unchanged, and these principles and views entertained and expressed by me heretofore shall be the same in the future should I have the honor to represent you at the Legislative Council. You must deal with Curry. If you do not, he will sit here in Niagara and use every inch and every column of every newspaper to taunt you and complicate your message. What about something like, there is one point, however, I beg leave to refer to, as it is one of the reasons assigned by the late member, the Honorable J.G. Curry, for his resignation. Namely, that he could not assist in carrying out the principles of Confederation to which he is opposed. I have always been an advocate of Confederation, 
looking upon it as almost indispensable to our existence as part of the British Empire. I shall be ready, if called upon, to assist to the extent of my ability to realize all of the advantages and benefits to our country. That, that should work well. I feel it is my duty to respond to your call and, if necessary, ask for your suffrage. I have the honor to be, gentlemen, your obedient servant, James Ray Benson. Well done, dear. In honor of the 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation, the 2017 Guided Spirit Walks explored the story of Confederation in St. Catharines through multiple voices and perspectives. Liberal in his politics, James G. Curry strongly advocated against Confederation, citing that the timing was not right and that, with the government so young, corruption was inevitable. Trained as a lawyer, Curry first began serving in politics in 1856 and in 1862 he was elected as a member of the Legislative Council of the Province of Canada representing Niagara. He resigned in 1865 due to his opposition of Confederation. In sharing Curry's strong beliefs against Confederation as well as other voices often overlooked in the historical record, we wanted to break the traditional narrative of how Canada became a country and reveal that the path to building one dominion was much bumpier than we are taught to believe in history class. In this next scene, James Curry, portrayed by Armin Romanoli, rants his views against Confederation, while his wife, Emma Curry, portrayed by Irene Romanoli, urges him to accept the inevitable. It is worth noting that while Emma would not have had the right to vote in 1867, she devoted much of her life to patriotic work, namely researching and writing the biography of Laura Secord and advocating for the erection of a monument in Secord's honor at Queenston Heights. There could be no great love of union. Were the parties to be joined of not the slightest desire to associate with each other, right or wrong, Beneficial or otherwise, it is impossible to persuade the mass of the people that the system which gives them an equal voice in the government of the country is not the best. Furthermore, to pass confederation without asking the voice of the people will only be sowing the seed of dissatisfaction and contention among a very large portion of our population. If there is to be no general election on confederation, the polling booths might as well be turned into pig pens and the voters list cut up into pipe lighters. What's this about pig pens and pipe lighters, dear? You're not on about confederation again, are you? Tell me you're not sitting here in the dark alone preaching to yourself. I've just returned from the Welland House where Merritt and Schlecluna were discussing their support for Benson. Oh, the Bensons. They plan to have such a wonderful display at their home Clenenden to celebrate the new union. Oh, but that's meant to be a surprise, so, so do keep that to yourself, dear. I do not and cannot support Benson. I did not resign my seat on the Legislative Council to be replaced by the likes of him. The people will not stand for it. He is friends with MacDonald and is keen to give up our local autonomy. I wish you would leave your anger on the street, James. I thought your resignation would mean peace in my sitting room. Think about the duty that you will have on Dominion Day. There will no doubt be military demonstrations. Military demonstrations? Surely you do not think I will march. Surely by now it's too late to oppose the Union, James. I know that Confederation has been a contentious issue for you and others, and one that is, that is probably quite close to your convictions. Yet at this point, should you not try to influence these men? 
make friends with them to make sure that your demands can be addressed under the new constitution. Politicians do not have friends, only accomplices. That is not the point. I do not know of anyone, including myself, opposed to the new union in the abstract. But my belief and impression is that the time has not arrived for any kind of union, and I will oppose it to the last. You will also march in the parade on Dominion Day. I will not march. The people and your men will think you a fool for not fulfilling your duty. You will march. Oh, don't forget to have your boots shined. Whenever the majority of the people speak in favor of union, let them have it. An allowance should not be given to change the Constitution without our consent. If the representatives are unfaithful to their trust and abuse their powers, any responsible government is not worthy of the name. If there be one quality which a representative of our country ought to cultivate at the present time above all others, it is independence. I will not march. St. Catherine's own Lillian Phelps was a well-known activist, in-demand speaker, and prolific writer at the turn of the century. Touring the lecture circuit in North America and in Europe, and publishing many articles, Phelps was well ahead of her time as an outspoken advocate for topics including temperance, woman suffrage, and pay equity for women. Included in her impressive list of public activism, Lillian was involved with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. In this next scene, Lillian Phelps, portrayed by longtime Spirit Walks volunteer Brenda Schultz, delivers a passionate speech urging for temperance among the workers of the Welland Ship Canal. Is the drunkard sick or is he sinful? Shall the man who is crazy on purpose go to hospital or to jail? Is he vicious or victimized? Shall he be prisoner or patient? In the man's body, he is sick, and in his soul, he sins. Treat him for both diseases, for this is a case of a sick sinner. Working conditions at the construction site, long 10-hour days in the heat, with little rest or nourishment, are taking their toll on the poor men whom fate has dealt a low hand. They are driven to drink by their own ignorance of God and exhaustion of the mind. The sickness and the sin are driven by the horse whips of the contractors. The dangerous conditions at which they arrive to and work in daily are sure to blame for the many stories of heavy drinking and violence in the camps we have heard recently. Men have developed the monster by which they are now slain. They have carved the image with head of gold, feet of clay, and arms of molten steel. They named it civilization, and today in every nation they are writhing in its grasp. The man who says, I can carry more liquor than any other drinker in town, and yet keep a level head, gives by that claim an inventory of goods already badly damaged. The brain today must think with lightning speed, the hand must be steadfast as steel, and the pulse must be strong yet true if a great commercial nation is to hold its own with the forces of electricity now on the job. But let us take pride and see hope in the fact that at present the consumption of liquors is banned. Let us rejoice and take courage. The electric light fights against rum. Every witty invention, every intricate machine, every swift-moving engine hastens the dominance of the right 
and good and truth. Do not abandon your cause, for our work will not be done until the camps of the Welland Ship Canal are safe and dry for all who find shelter there. The passionate speech given by Phelps was from the 2015 tours, which shared the stories of the fallen workers of the Welland Ship Canal. Apart from the many accidents on the work site, Life for workers along the canal was sometimes mired by violence, fueled by racial tensions between immigrant laborers of different nationalities. Richard Boyle, a police constable, was stationed in Meriton and was often the officer who responded to outbreaks of violence at the canal camps. His name appears in countless news articles detailing his investigations into violence, public drunkenness, and even theft of dynamite from government stores. This scene follows Phelps' impassioned speech this evening, as it did in 2015. Boyle is portrayed by Ian Ashman, who has volunteered with the walks since the program's inception in 2012. You there! Where were you on the evening of September 12, 1915? Ah, so no knowledge of a Mr. Fisher chat? An Austrian working on Section 1 of the Welland Ship Canal? An altercation took place between Mr. Fisher chat and another foreigner, believed to have been an Italian, but he escaped before his identity could be confirmed. By the time I arrived at the scene, I found Mr. Fisher chat with a deep gash in his side some six inches long. No? Well, we'll see about that. Where were you on the night of January 8th, 1916? No, no answer, eh? Quiet bunch. Does any of this sound familiar? One man was seriously injured, and two others were cut on the head and chest in the general fracas among the foreigners on Section 1 of the Welland Ship Canal during a riotous celebration of the Russian Christmas Day. A number of Austrians from the East Bank had crossed over in an attempt to disrupt the celebrations of the Russians. One man was hit in the head with a broken bottle, his head severely gashed. Another was slashed about the chest and stomach. I tell you, Dr. McComb at the Canal Hospital is quite busy. By the time I arrived, I found that the chief assailant had escaped down the lakeshore, pursued by the main body of celebrants. When I arrived, I found that only those few injured and drunk men left were around to be questioned, and they provided no useful information. But I called License Inspector King to the scene, and it is no surprise to either of us that both parties had been drinking excessively. In fact, two bootleggers were arrested in connection with the brawl. These foreigners seem to be laughing at our attempts to control alcohol in this province. You! Aren't you that political organizer who's been causing problems for the mayor? You wouldn't happen to know anything about the missing dynamite, would you? Yes, dynamite! 28 cases, almost 1,400 pounds of dynamite, gone missing from the Dominion government stores near Allenburg. The theft was discovered recently, and it is believed that unemployed Reds in the vicinity performed the crime. Government authorities are now investigating since it is believed that the dynamite is going to be used by unemployed Reds in the vicinity to try to blow up the canal. Aha! And what about the murder at Port Weller on July 29, 1919? No one to answer for that either? The foreigner's camp was found alive with booze that night by Sergeant McCarthy and myself. We'd been called to investigate the murder of an old man named Peter Talsma. The foreigners had been drink indulging in heavy drinking, and a quarrel had resulted, the old man taking part. It seems he was struck over the head with a bottle and suffered other serious injuries as well. A number have been arrested, but we're still looking for one or two assailants. Inspector King and I also charged one Emma Coif with keeping a disorderly house and with possession of alcohol. Uh, yes, well, 
and no one plan on leaving the city, I will be visiting each and every one of you to further my investigation. Isabella Frampton Hawken was an innovative businesswoman and leader in St. Catharines. Hawken followed the engineering path of her family, working her way up to foreperson of the Packard Electric Company's lamp department by age 22. She established her own electric works company only nine years later. However, due to the limitations placed on women at the time, her business, Dominion Electric Company, and her patent to renew burnt out bulbs were both officially in her husband's name. Isabella's story was featured in the 2018 Spirit Walks, which examined how the end of the First World War impacted the people of St. Catharines. Here, Isabella Frampton Hawken is featured alongside three working women who together express the conflicting pressures placed on women to first contribute to the war effort by laboring in traditionally masculine fields of work and then by being called back into the domestic sphere and into the home after the war was won and the men returned. When I established Dominion Electric Company, my own business, with my then future husband James in 1901, I never imagined we would transition from male workers to female workers, nor would I have imagined that our factories would be in the thick of the munitions business, the business of war. Well, it's back to the kitchen for me. To tell you the honest truth, if it weren't for social prestige and all that sort of thing, I'd rather be a cook than a professional woman. Though, of course, I'd rather be Bob's wife than either. When Bob enlisted, I went back to the work I did before my marriage. It was work I was exceptionally good at, I might add, but I'm a good cook too. Bob's just been discharged, and when people ask me if I am glad to be going back to my kitchen, I'll just say thoroughly, heartily, and mitigatingly glad. I consider myself very fortunate to have the professional status that I do. They say that in 1901, women made up only 1% of the workforce in Canada. With so many of our men leaving their work to fight overseas, more women are now working to do their bit. Women are needed on farms and munitions factories for knitting and sewing soldiers' comforts. I myself hired a good number of women to fill the lines of my operation. Without them, surely Dominion Electric would not have survived the war. Now, we knew that such a labor opportunity might only last the length of the war, but that doesn't mean that each of my women didn't hold out some bit of hope that their value might now be seen outside of the home. What will come of their work when the war is over and the men have returned? Could these women stand having to ask their husbands for money after earning their own for so long? Wanted, young lady for clerical work must write good hand and be accurate and fast with figures. McKinnon Dash Company. Wanted, several girls for packing room. Welch Grape Juice Co, Weston Hill. I know one woman who never worked before her husband went overseas, who has become so fascinated with earning her own living, she declares she will never go back to what she calls household drudgery. She can very well afford, if she goes on with her work, to keep a housekeeper, and that is what she is determined to do. I don't think my husband exactly likes me working. He too has recently returned home. Tom is awfully proud, of course, that I've been able to make good, but he rather hates to lose that clinging vine effect of our relationship. And what of Annie Maynard of 50 Queenston Street? Just this year she was appointed policewoman, you should see her patrol in the streets of St. Catharines, baton in hand, just like any other constable. What will happen to her position? Will she still be employed after the war? The government has begun to consider what's next for the munition plants under its control. The old Packard Electric Facility, which the government took over to manufacture artillery shells. Or McKinnon Dash, where many women were employed in the making of fuse and shells for the front. They say that when the war is over, they'll divert these industries back to export trade. 
there are posters going around urging employers that the first and most obvious step in the reinstatement of ex-servicemen is their re-employment in their former trade. Once local boys return from the front, they will expect to resume the work they had done before they enlisted, leaving women without work. What's next for these women? Never of us be said we had no war to wage. Because our womanhood, because the weight of age, held us in servitude, none sees us fight, yet we in the long night battle to give release. To all whom we must send to seek and die for peace. When they have gone, we in twilight place, meet terror face to face, and strive with him that we may save our fortitude alive. Theirs be the hard, but ours the lonely bed. Not were we spared. Of us, this word shall not be said. The stories of our spirit walk in 2015 focused on the 138 men who lost their lives building the Welland Ship Canal between 1913 and 1932. The tragic story of James MacArthur Sr. and his son, James MacArthur Jr., was included in the 2016 tour commemorating the First World War. The MacArthur father and son team had both fought and survived the First World War and upon their return took up riveting work on the Welland Ship Canal, dressing the large lock gates with their steel plates. On August 2nd, 1928, James Sr. and James Jr. were crushed and killed instantly when the 500-ton gate fell. This was one of just many accidents that marked the construction of the Welland Ship Canal as the most deadly peacetime construction project in the 20th century. I was son and brother to these men buried here. Tragedy is not assigned only to war. And death can unexpectedly strike in peacetime as well. After the Great War, my family settled here in St. Catharines, and both my father and brother began work on the new Welland Ship Canal. I joined them too. The three of us often worked together as steel workers, but we don't work together anymore. It's been a few years now, but on August 2nd, 1928, they both went to work at the canal like any other normal day except this day they never returned. They were two of the eight who were killed at Lock 6 when one of the two cranes employed in working with one of the 500 ton steel gates gave way. The crane fell over the wall and pushed the gate downwards to the bottom of the lock, crushing its victims below. 22 others were seriously injured. My father and brother were able to survive three wars between them, nearly untouched, unscathed. They came back to work on this great national object, only to be killed in the most freakish of accidents seen in recent construction history. At least the government has promised to inscribe their names on a memorial so that their service and their sacrifice would not be forgotten. With broken hands, heads, and limbs, beneath this soil, two sunny gems await the call of Gabriel. A strong historical personality, Bessie Monroe Mullock has made two appearances in the Guided Spirit Walks, in 2014 and again in 2018. Both tours highlighted her tireless campaign work to support soldiers fighting overseas during the First World War. In this scene, Mullick, portrayed here by Irene Romanoli, and her daughter Gwendolyn, portrayed by Tristan Tompkins, prepare donations for the many campaigns Bessie helped lead during the First World War. A great number of St. Catherine's women on the home front banded together during the war to organize sock and canned good drives, knitting campaigns, and other donation efforts to support the men in the trenches. Bessie's daughter, Dr. Gwendolyn Mullick, was the first 
female doctor to practice in St. Catharines. Hello, so wonderful to see you. Have you brought anything for the clothing guy today? Mother is working very diligently in the back on sorting and gathering. Who is that? Who are you talking to? Oh, it's just someone who's brought donations for the clothing drive, Mother. Where are they? Where are your donations? Surely you didn't come all this way without your donations. Mother, stop pestering them. Do you know what those donations of clothes and blankets are used for? They do a great deal of comfort for the men coming home from the front. Our work is very important, Gwendolyn. Everyone must do their part, even you. There is not enough food in all the world for them if you refuse to do your small individual share. And it is so very little that is asked of you. Only to do without beef and bacon on two days of the week and to substitute the largest possible percentage of oatmeal, barley, rye, cornmeal or buckwheat for white flour. Cut down sugar to the lowest point. Buy no clothes whatever that are not absolutely needed for protection. Never mind shabby shoes, clothes, hats, and furs. Wool is so scarce there may be a great difficulty in keeping our defenders warm. Possibly a single unnecessary suit or overcoat may mean frozen limbs for one of your own loved ones. Every new dress, woolen garment, those knitted jerseys that women have been mad over may mean for one of our men pneumonia, rheumatism, sending them back to their cruelly selfish and meanly ungrateful country, pitiful, ruined, helpless wrecks of noble manhood. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mother is very busy. The needs of the men coming home from the front are drastic. There's a great deal of things to do. There is a great deal to do. There is a war on. But as unfortunate as it is, the war has brought Canadian women together like never before in a bond of sympathy and sacrifice and cooperation in the many activities in which their patriotism has found such a useful expression. In every community, War work has, has done much to break down the class distinctions and snobbery which flourished in this young country as in older lands. Mother is very passionate about our work. She is the president and regent of the local chapter of the Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire. She's held that position since 1912, but since she won't let you forget that she founded the society back in the 1900s. She's undertaken a huge number of projects from clothing drives and fundraising campaigns, and that doesn't even include the charity work beyond the war efforts. She knits so much and so quickly that sometimes I think her needles would catch on fire and burn the house down. The class barriers which were burned down in the fires of the war ought not to be rebuilt. Perhaps the new and wider opportunities of public service opening to women and the interest in politics and problems of government, which will be stimulated by women's eventual franchise, will turn into rational channels much of the energy hitherto wasted in a rapid round of pleasures. It would be a great gain if the serious outlook and idea of service, which many fashionable women have acquired during the war, become the habit and the custom. Certainly, during this period of testing, the Canadian women have developed a capacity for leadership and organization, which has set the pace for the men. She's working on an important plan to donate a piece of land where Church and Kin Street intersect. The land was purchased by the IODE for $1,700 through various fundraising efforts. The IODE want to call it a memorial park to honor all the lost souls this awful war has seen. She hopes to present the land to the mayor and have the city create a memorial garden. She's the reason I want to become a doctor. Come along, Gwendolyn. It's time for the march. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. We're going to be late. Edward Gardiner was a canal surveyor and engineer for the Welland Ship Canal. Gardiner's story was featured on the 2015 walks and highlights just how dramatically the construction of the Welland Ship Canal reshaped the geography of the area where many families and whole communities in some cases were relocated, all in the name of industrial progress.
Where did I put it? Where did it go? I don't understand. Oh, there's the map. Oh, Olive, would you hold that map up for me? Um, no, no. Turn it around. Turn it around. Okay, good, good, good. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Edward Gardner, canal surveyor and engineer. Now, pay attention. Now we're here. We need to go here and then across this way, back up that way. All the stuff in the middle has got to go. We're here. We need to go here and then go that way and then back up this way. And all the farms and the families and the houses in the middle need to move. Got it? Look, folks. The construction crews can't get in to build this thing if we don't hurry up, survey out the route, and move those families. I know a lot of people will lose some farmland and houses and barns, and it's a shame that we have to demolish the historic St. Peter's Church, but at least local families will be given time to move the bodies of their loved ones from the cemetery before it's flooded. All in the name of progress. So. The proposed canal will enter from Lake Ontario at the mouth of Ten Mile Creek, about three miles east of the present canal at Port Dalhousie. The total length of the canal from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie is 25 miles. And the distance and level between the two lakes will be 325 feet. Got that in meters? Metric? Ha! <laughs> According to Mr. Weller, the dimensions of the locks will have a lift of 46 feet, a length of 800 feet, and a width of 80 feet. The route will need a depth of 25 feet only. But all the stretches will be sunk to the 30-foot level so that the canal can be deepened at a future date and by simply dredging out the reaches. Clear? Crystal, Mr. Weller is my father, so I know quite a lot about the canal. That's enough out of you. Now, now hold that map up. I don't know how it will work, but Mr. Weller wants a single leaf lock gate, swinging on a hinge on one side and resting in a notch at the opposite wall. Seems to be he hasn't considered the pressure of the water. Though he's proposing each gate will weigh 1,100 tons, so maybe it'll work. So, you can see how important it is for us to get the people in the way of the construction now out of the way so that we can get started. What do you mean? Didn't you survey a route that was clear of private property? What? Grantham and St. Catharines is filled with farms and farmhouses and barns and sheds. Of course we had to take the route through some front yards, back fields, and straight through a few front porches. Their land will be flooded too, but it's all in the name of progress. Now, we have all this preliminary work for the Welland Railway to do. Because of our new route, we need to move the Welland Railway from Meriton through Grantham west several hundred feet. You know, the old Campbell Farm. Yes, I love that place. Well, it was in the way. So we had to cut 30 acres of trees to make room for the canal work yards. The company tore down the house and barns too. They were too old, too small to be of any use. The property has been appropriated as the headquarters for the plan of the Confederation Construction Company. They're the ones that are going to build several locks. A railway track had to be built in from the NS&T and several train loads of machinery and equipment have been deposited. Sounds like they have a load of horse teams, dump cars, scrapers, steam shovels and large and small tools. They're going to build a couple of huge three-story boarding houses for the thousands of men who will be employed. But never mind the past. It's all in the name of progress. Now, get to work. The 2019 Spirit Walks spanned across several decades and told stories of the famous and the infamous. The tour featured historical moments of scandal, murder, tragedy, and questionable ethics often overlooked in the overarching narratives of St. Catherine's past. The 1920s era of prohibition and temperance advocacy in the early 1900s drew up a particular level of infamy during its time. To tell this story, the 2019 walks introduced audiences
to Women's Christian Temperance Union activist Florence Nelson and St. Catherine's detective Duncan Brown, who had pursued a number of bootleggers and moonshiners during his career in the 1920s and 30s. Hello, Duncan. Thank you for meeting me for tea. As you know, my name is Florence Nelson, and I am the secretary of the St. Catherine's Women's Christian Temperance Union. I'm glad to have this time to talk to you today about signing our petition. Florence, you never pass up an opportunity to get your signatures. I don't think the government is going to reinstate the Temperance Act. It's already been repealed now for a couple of years. Is it really worth the work to keep going on? Duncan, I will never stop fighting for what is right. Canada is too beautiful a country to fall to the evils of liquor. Look at poor Ina Burgoyne. Her son may still be alive if it weren't for that Hartley man's alcohol problem. Hartley was a drunk. The night before he killed poor Teddy, he was downtown drinking. Yet another example of the evils of liquor. Florence, I see your passion about temperance hasn't changed. And now the government wants to raise the alcohol percentage in beer to 4%. 2.5% was already far too high. Alcohol wrecks the home, blights lives, separates husband and wife, sends the drunken son forth a wanderer and a reproach upon the earth. We have viewed this evil many times, but we will accept the challenge of the enemy. Florence, I know why you do what you do, but is it really worth the work? I mean, the United States is already in discussions about repealing their temperance laws. We are back in a crisis in our national history, and we must continue to secure and circulate compelling literature we cannot give up, Duncan. Is alcohol a good creature of God? Science says most emphatically no. I must keep fighting. Given your most recent promotion to the detective branch of the police force, I thought you would agree. You'd get to catch all of those nasty bootleggers and moonshiners. Where there's prohibition, there's bootleggers. And bootleggers keep me employed. But I've been policing since 1920, and if there's one thing I've learned, prohibition doesn't stop drinking. People will always find a way. My friend Jimmy and I were called to this house once, and the place smelled distinctly of alcohol. We searched the whole house from top to bottom and couldn't find a thing until I knelt by a plant for one final inspection and noticed from the stems sticking out a tiny spout which when turned sent forth a jet of pure alcohol, like a tap. I tell you, every time we moved that plant, the lady of the house stood there smirking. If only more women understood the virtue of temperance. You know, women are 54% of the population. We have a majority. If we could just come together. Still, people will go to extreme lengths to get their alcohol. My friend and I were called to another house once. We had heard a tip that the man inside was smuggling liquor to the United States. When we went inside, we found the man of the house in an easy chair with an empty bottle of whiskey at his side. We caught him in the act. When we came in, he was in the process of lighting his pipe. And when he saw us, he took the match, tossed it into a spittoon at the foot of the chair, and boom! Ooh. Explosion! By the time I recovered from the surprise of it all, all the alcohol in the spittoon and all the other evidence had vanished. Despicable! <laughs> you could have been killed, Duncan! Oh, maybe if the Temperance Act was in place, you wouldn't have to face such dangers at work. <laughs> or would it be worse? Smugglers and bootleggers are not known to be the most friendly people. Like that Rocco Perry to think. The king of bootleggers started his business here in St. Catharines before going to Hamilton. I'm not really up on the Perry operations these days, but I heard his wife was just killed, shot in their garage. I hear thousands of people showed up in Hamilton on the day of her funeral. Probably out of fear. Now, we've gotten very far off topic here, Duncan. Back to the important topic at hand. 
Our city is quite clearly corrupt these days with the evils of alcohol, which is why I need your help here. Take our pledge, touch not, taste not, that's our motto. By signing our campaign, you are promising to use your influence to make known the benefits of the Ontario Temperance Act. We need it back. Now, repeat after me. I hereby promise by the help of God. I hereby promise by the help of dog. To abstain from the use of all intoxicating liquors. To indulge in the use of all intoxicating liquors. Oh. Including wine, beer, and cider as a beverage. Especially wine, beer, Duncan, and cider as a beverage. You are deplorable. I would have thought by now you would understand the importance of what... Oh, I never. Oh, that's it. Oh. Casting our annual guided spirit walks can sometimes be challenging and involves matching our wonderful volunteer actors with historical personalities. In this next case, the lack of male identifying actors in 2013 offered the opportunity for audiences to learn the history of two important shipbuilders and captains, James Norris and Sylvester Nealon, through the eyes of James's wife and Sylvester's sister, Saffronia Norris. Portrayed by Tammy Freeman, Sophronia makes almost no appearance in the historical record, which exposes the unfortunate exclusion of women's narratives from history. Oh, it's you, again. Let me guess. You're here to talk about my husband or brother. What a surprise. Why is everyone only ever interested in the stories of my husband, Captain Norris, and my brother, his business partner, Captain Nealon? <laughs> no one ever wants to hear my story. Why are we only ever interested in the boys? I've had enough. Listen, I led an interesting life, a very interesting life. Being a lady of the Victorian period here in St. Catharines, not a lot of people wrote about me. You must understand how offending that is. It makes me and all Victorian women seem lazy. It makes it seem like we sat around all day drinking tea. Well, we had lots of things to do, and just because historians and academics and journalists didn't write about us in their books or papers or letters, doesn't mean we weren't hard workers. They were only ever interested in James and Sylvester's endeavors. Here, a Toronto Globe article written in 1881 about James. <clears throat> of the marked men of Canada who by tact and perseverance have won fame and fortune and in doing so have contributed largely to the development of the country, few deserve so high a place as Mr. James Norris of St. Catharines. Success in the life is not always to be measured by the amount of wealth accumulated, but yet one who rises without a stain upon his honor and without having his nature warped or his finer instincts blunted can well claim to have achieved a large degree of true success. Not that the life of the subject of this notice has been attended with usual difficulties, for it has not, but that the face may have been due chiefly to the combination of the self-reliant spirit, the faithful discharge of the duties of a lowly position, the enterprise and determination to succeed, the unblemished confidence begetting integrity, and the good judgment which knew how to grasp the skits of happy chance, which we exhibited in uncommon measure in Mr. Norris. <sighs> How could one possibly compete with that? Your husband is one of few who deserves so high a place in the development of our country. When he died, a two-mile line of carriages and people stretched to the cemetery from the city. He died, and the city literally shut down. 
His funeral was on a Tuesday at 3 p.m. All the merchants in the city decide to close their respective places of business for the afternoon. Because my brother Sylvester died so close to New Year's Day, Reverend Kerr decided that the usual ringing in of the bells should be dispensed with and the chimes made silent until his burial. Huh. I remember when Sylvester first talked to me about his new friend, James Norris, whom he met in 1848 in Port Dalhousie aboard a schooner in dock. The two young sailors formed a liking for each other, which was cemented in the two years they spent sailing together on the same vessel. When Sylvester introduced me to James, I was very impressed. How could I not be? James and I were married soon after. I remember one night, I was finishing up the washing up after dinner with Sylvester. The two of them were sitting on the doorstep as it was too hot in the house. They were talking about buying up their own ships and doing the runs themselves instead of for other captains. They figured they could do it better and faster and make more money that way. So they entered into a verbal agreement and with their few hundred dollars went to Mr. Shakluna to purchase a vessel. He trusted them to pay him the rest of the money when they had it. But I was there, too. Where am I in the story? That's right, washing dishes. <sighs> Eventually, James said he was interested in serving in Parliament. The boys agreed that they had a successful run in business, but that dissolving the partnership would be for the best. They focused on their families, and James worked on getting elected. He was sent to Ottawa in 1874 and did some great work. Around the same time, my brother Sylvester was elected into our provincial parliament. He served in office until 1886. So, they were famous politicians, rich, successful, full businessmen and everyone loved them. You can see how easily my story gets lost under the weight of theirs. <laughs> Next time we talk about me and only me. Got it? Before we arrive at our last scene this evening, I would like to take a moment on behalf of the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center and the entire Guided Spirit Walks cast and crew to thank you for tuning in to tonight's virtual presentation of Playing Favorites, Stories from the Past. We are incredibly grateful for your continued support and enthusiasm, and we hope that we can gather again at Victoria Lawn Cemetery for a new season of vibrant stories from St. Catherine's Past next September. Please consider making a donation to the museum in support of our programming by contacting the museum at 905-984-8880 or by emailing museum at stcatherines.ca. While serving overseas during the First World War, Lieutenant Jack House wrote to his fiance, Jane Eighty weekly. In this next scene, Jack and Jane read together the letters he wrote to her from the trenches in France. Their love story was featured in the 2016 tours. Jack had met Jane through her five brothers, who were also members of the Henley Rowing Club. After returning home with injuries that discharged him from active duty, Jack and Jane were married at Knox Presbyterian Church on June 26, 1918. Here, Jack House and Jane Eighty are portrayed by real life sweethearts and longtime Spirit Walk volunteers, Fraser and Brittany Morgan. Dear Jane, 
You ought to have seen your Jack when he first landed in the dressing station. You wouldn't have owned him, I am sure. I hadn't had a wash or a shower for a week. I looked like Robinson Crusoe. My right arm is bandaged from end to end and in a sling. And my left hand has a big bandage around it too. A nice big rat got, got too, too affectionate, affectionate one night and, night and tried, tried to, to kiss me. me. And when I knocked him off, none too gently, he resented it and took a bite out of the back of my hand and poisoned it a bit. So I was well bandaged up and good and dirty and looked as though I had really been wounded. Love your boy, Jack. My dear Jane, I am in the line at present and not much time to write, but we'll get busy, my dear, at the very first opportunity. Heaps of mud and, and water and shells, shells but I am feeling, feeling fit. fit. Heaps of love, Jack. My dear honey, you have no doubt read all about the big scrap and what the Canadians have been doing and wondering where your Jackie is. Came through without a scratch, Janie, thanks to my good maker, and am now out for a rest and a cleanup, which I need rather badly, particularly the cleanup. I haven't had my clothes off since I went in just a week ago yesterday, but it certainly seems like an age. The day and the hour were set. And although we didn't know it then, it turned out to be daylight, Easter Monday. And I'll tell you, Jane, Easter Monday was a great day for Canadians. We gave the Huns a good push that'll take them some time to get over. Pushed them back about three miles and took a good many prisoners. We were sent into the line a few days beforehand to get everything ready. And we worked hard with mud and water up to our knees most of the time getting ammunition up. It's wonderful how cheery the fellows can keep under the very worst conditions. The night before the show, the attacking troops were all taken out into no man's land without a word being spoken or the least noise because we knew that if the Huns heard us, it would be all up. It was rather an anxious time lying out there waiting for the final moment. Then, at 5.30, just the first streak of dawn, the artillery opened up, a terrific barrage, and shells of all sorts and sizes fell like hail just in front of us on Fritz's trenches. Up went his distress signals in all colors, and away we went with a rush into the roar and the flash. Just what my feelings were about then would be hard to describe. They pushed on and on with a determination that nothing on earth could stand up against, over line after line of trenches, right up over the ridge and well down the other side. Just stopping once to get together, and a breath of air, and on again. When the Huns came running towards us with their hands up, yelling, Comrade, we collected them all in and made them carry wounded fellows back to the dressing station. I tell you, Jane, Canadian, Canadian Tommies, Tommies are, are like, like nothing, nothing on earth. They, they are, are wonderful, wonderful fellows. I forgot to tell you that as we were going from our support trenches up to the front line, we went through a tunnel about 500 yards long, wide enough for two men to walk past easily, and lighted with electric lights. This was the work of the engineers. Forgive me, dear, if I have talked a lot of war this time, but I knew it will interest you, and tomorrow, if I'm still out, I will take all your letters and write you a good, long answer. Regards to your people, and heaps of love to my own dear girl. Night, night. Jack. You're a bear, Jane. My, that was a sock shower, wasn't it? You must have been a busy little girl. Just think, I didn't know a thing about it until the bundles got here last night. You see, I'm in the line again, now living in an old cellar where we mustn't show our noses in the daytime. And you can imagine how my eyes opened when they brought my rations in last night in four sandbags. I couldn't imagine what it was all about. And here were the socks, three parcels of them, and cigarettes and games and sugar, all done up so nicely like nobody else could do it. I asked, I asked you, you for, for some socks one, one day, didn't, didn't I? I? Pretty nervy of me, but I'd forgotten all about it until sure enough, they landed here with a bump. 
And just think, my little Jane ran the whole thing herself. And wasn't it just grand the way all the good people came and gave? Would you thank them one and all for me, Jane dear? And I tell you, they will be more than appreciated by the fellows, particularly now that they are in the line where nice clean socks and smokes are at a premium. I am going to distribute them tonight. You must have been just tickled to pieces with the whole thing, Jane. But it couldn't be anything else but a grand success when you were engineering it, my love. And I tell you, I am more than proud of my own sweet girl. Heaps and heaps, heaps of, of love, love to my, my own, own and only girly, Jack.